Shear center is basically the point where a shear force can act without producing any twist in the section. As you can see in the following figures below that these are all symmetric cross sections. When a load passes through the center of gravity, the section will displace along the line of symmetry. So let's look at these four figures. In the top right figure, after a shear force is applied to the free end of the beam, the displaced shape can be shown in the red outline. In the other figures, we can see how the shape is displaced. The dotted black line represents the shape in its original position before a shear force was applied. We can see that the shapes displace along the same axis as the shear force. Now, what if shear force is applied along a principal centroidal axis that is not an axis of symmetry? Well, as you can see here, when sections are not symmetric about the axis through which the load is being applied, the section will want to twist, also known as torque. In this figure, we can see that once the shear force is applied to the cantilever beam, the beam will want to twist and will end up looking like this. The twist occurs due to the nature of shear flow through the C channel. A more in-depth view of this shear flow can be seen with the figure in the middle and will be explained in an example in the next video. Now let's take a look at the shear flow in the cross section. Let Q represent the shear flow distribution. The top portion here, let's call this Q1, this portion Q2, and this bottom portion Q3. Remember, the shear flow equation is Q equals VQ over I. And Q is equal to A prime times Y bar. Y bar is the distance from the neutral axis to the center of this section, and which in this case would be A prime. When we integrate the shear flow distribution Q over each piece of section, we can find the force at that section. For this cross section, we know that the forces will look like this, which is also known as the integrated flow. Let's redraw the previous cross section and replace the shear flow with, with its corresponding force resultant. Let S represent the shear center. Let F1 be the force resultant F for the top portion. Let F2 be the force resultant for the middle section. Let F3 be the force resultant for the bottom portion. And V is the shear force that is being applied to the shear center. Let the distance between F1 and F3 be equal to H. So that means from the neutral axis to F1, the distance will be H over 2. E is going to represent the distance to the shear center from F2. After we plot the Q distribution, we can move on to take a moment about point S to solve for E, which is the distance to the shear center. So let's start off with our moment equation about point S and assume counterclockwise is positive. From our diagram, we can see that F1 and F3 are equal, as well as F2 and B. So we can simplify this equation into this. Then isolating for E, we get this as the final answer. E equals F1 over V times H. Keep in mind that E is the distance to the shear center, which is S. Some important points to keep in mind is that shear center will always lie on the axis of symmetry for singly symmetric cross sections. The location of the shear center is only a function of the geometry of the cross section and does not depend upon the applied loading. And the proof for that will be in the example we will be doing in the next video. Let's go through the steps on how we can solve shear center problems. First, we want to draw the shear flow diagram and then find the resultant forces by integrating the shear flow over each piece of channel. Second, we want to take moments about a point A. Choose A so that el it eliminates the moments of as many force resultants as possible. Third, we then solve to find E, which is the distance to the shear center. In the next video, we'll be demonstrating all of this in an example. 